the summer of 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea near Russia. Unfortunately, hundreds of people died in the icy water. Later, an investigation into exactly what happened revealed though, the horrible truth behind the accident. There wasn't a problem with anybody's radar system. There was no fog that made things very difficult to see. The cause of the crash was human stubbornness. Each captain was aware of the other vessel, of the presence of the other ship nearby. Both could have steered clear of the other, but neither captain wanted to give way to the other. Each ship was too proud to be the one to yield first. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late, and hundreds of people died. Pride is something that destroys, isn't it? We're in the Gospel of Mark in Mark chapter 9. I would invite you to turn there this morning. Where we're at and then our journey through Mark is that Jesus has told his disciples, actually as we get to today's scripture, twice Jesus has told his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, there I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised again. The disciples still aren't quite understanding what's happening, but they're on their way to go to Jerusalem, but apparently they stop in Jesus' adopted hometown of Capernaum, uh, which is where he had his basis, his base of operations uh, during his ministry. So we're going to pick it up this morning with verse 33 of Mark 9. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. We'll stop there for just a minute. Anybody, can anybody identify with those verses? What's happening here? Jesus, first of all, asks a question. Now, when Jesus asks his disciples a question, usually it means that he's going to teach them something. Jesus wasn't just a guy that asked a lot of questions unless there was a purpose behind him, at least as recorded in the gospel. Maybe Jesus asked more questions that they didn't feel like were necessary to write down. But when Jesus asks a question in the gospels, it means he has something he wants to address, something he wants to teach. And so Jesus asked them, so what was it that you were arguing about on the road? Now, do you think that Jesus didn't know? Jesus knew what they were arguing about on the road. He's, he's bringing this up because he wants to, to teach them something. But he knew exactly what they were arguing about. Now, that's one thing, if you've been a parent, you understand, especially if you have more than one child, they can argue, Right? Sometimes about things that just don't make any sense at all. I don't know why you're arguing about this, uh, but why are, you, why are you fighting about this? This isn't important, right? They can fight about what day of the week it is. And sometimes I think they just like to spat, right? And, and that's not just kids, that's us, right? We like to get into debates with people. We like to argue more than we should. Now, we have to be careful when we do that, right? I mean, Proverbs 17, 14 says, Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. What is that? What is he saying when he says it's like breaching a dam? Well, what happens when you have a dam and then a little bit starts to trickle over that? What happens is it washes out, the, the hole gets bigger, next thing you know the whole dam is destroyed, and everything that was downriver is now flooded. Solomon's teaching us, be careful when you start an argument because you don't know where it's going to lead. You may mean it to be just this like this, but it grows into this big problem, right? So we have to be careful. But it says here in Mark 9 that when Jesus asked the disciples, uh, what are you arguing about? They don't answer him. Now, why is that? It comes down to, to two syllables, bus 10. They know that he knows what they were arguing about. And they know that he's not going to be happy about what it is that they were arguing about. Why? Because what are they arguing about? Not where they should go eat lunch, right? Not, you know, whether Peter's outfit for the day matched or not. They were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. And we might read that and think, okay, well, this is just guys, right? And they're guys being guys, which is they're just ribbing each other, right? You know, we, we do that as guys, right? Ethan, we, we pick on each other, right? 
I'm better at basketball than you. No way, I'm better. Whatever it is, we can try to one-up each other and argue about which one of us is best, but really that's not what's going on here. It's not like they're just kind of being guys joking with one another about, oh, I'm better than you are. Oh, I'm more mature. I know scripture better than you. They're actually, the Greek word here refers to like actually having a, a debate, a reasoned debate about which one of them was the best disciple. Now, what's really happening here, um, they, they still don't quite get that Jesus is going to die. They don't understand it. They don't probably even believe it. They're, they're expecting the kingdom of God to come very soon, and they're arguing over which one of them is going to get the best positions in the cabinet. They're measuring drapes for their office, Trying to say, oh, I'm going to get the corner office because I feel Jesus took me up on the mountain uh, for uh, transfiguration. Uh, he did, he's taken me to all these places, uh, and I'm the one that answers the questions correctly. And he's, they're finding all sorts of reasons to, I, well, I think maybe it's Peter. I think maybe it's John. They're, they're trying to figure out, like, which one of them is going to get the best positions in the kingdom of heaven when it comes inevitably in just a few weeks. They're preparing to be rich, preparing to be famous, preparing to be in charge, sitting on thrones, overseeing the entire world. And unless we assume that they're going to understand completely what Jesus is teaching them here, it continues. Because in the next chapter, in Mark 10, we read uh, that James and John, two brothers, they have their mom come to Jesus and uh, ask, hey, can you can my sons have the big cabinet positions, right? Can they be the right-hand man? So they still don't get it, even after this chapter. I, I think we need to be a little bit gentle with the disciples here. First of all, I think we can tend to think bigger of ourselves than we are, right? But the other thing is that it was not uncommon in first century Jewish society to behave this way because status was really important to Jews in the first century. There's another teaching where Jesus says, when you go to a banquet, he says, don't sit at the highest position at the table, but sit at the lowest so that the, the master of ceremonies will come to you and say, this is too humble of a place. You come and move over here in this honored place. It was just a part of their society that everybody kind of had a pecking order and you had to try to figure out among the people that are gathered here, where do I rate? And then you were supposed to sit at a, the place of the table that was where you are in that pecking order. And so Jesus says, don't, don't look for the, the biggest spot. Go sit at the, at the foot of the table. Be humble enough to sit there. And then maybe somebody will honor you because if you, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. If you humble yourself, yourself you will be exalted. Now, we maybe make too much of ourselves today, but our society in some, at least our church, I hope, doesn't operate much the same way that, that it did in first century Judea, right? Like, we don't have, like, the, the front pews are not, like, the honored guest pews, and then all the peons sit back there. At least I hope that's not... Or maybe, maybe there is something like that, and that's why nobody sits in the front. Maybe they feel like they're not... Uh, mature enough, and that's only, well, I don't know. But we don't do that, right? We don't say, well, the biggest contributors get to sit in this pew. Or we don't say, kind of like a football stadium, like, hey, you gave a lot of money to the church this year, you get to sit in one of the corporate suites, and a waitress will come and give you buffalo chicken wings uh, while you watch the worship service on the Jumbotron. We don't do that, right? Because we believe that all our are equal in Christ, male or female, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter in the kingdom of God. But that was just a part of Jewish society, so the disciples are doing maybe what you would expect to be done. Like, I am a better disciple than you. I, have, I know my scripture more. I was one of John the Baptist's disciples, and so I've kind of got an in, and they're arguing this way. So we come to verse 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Interesting, because this is a case where Jesus doesn't... Sometimes Jesus is talking to the twelve and then he says, Okay, wait a minute. And then he, gets, he addresses a whole crowd. 
Here Jesus is talking to the twelve. He has something specifically for the disciples, those who are assumed to be the greatest, the ones who you would assume are going to be in the cabinet in the kingdom of heaven because they've been following Jesus for these several years. They're ambitious. But Jesus changes the paradigm completely. What are they arguing about? They're arguing about who's going to be in charge of everybody else. They're going to order other people around. But Jesus says, no, don't do that. He says, if you want to be great, put yourself, don't try to be over people, put yourself under people. Put yourself under others. He says, be the servant of all. Who wants, he says, here, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. That means even the servant to the servants. You're not even trying to serve like the big guys. You're trying to serve the lowest. Jesus says, that's what we should be doing. The servant of God is marked by humility, not, not a false humility that does favors in order to be recognized, right? Sometimes people can be that way, like I'm uh, I'm trying to be pretending to be humble, but really I'm just trying to get a favor from you. No, he's saying being genuinely humble. Now, what is humility? Some people think like humility is like ripping on yourself, putting yourself down. Like I'm just no good. I'm I'm terrible. Um, everybody's better than me. That's not that's not really humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourselves. It's thinking of yourself less. Like, I'm not even just, I'm not focused on me, right? Even if you don't play that comparison game. First of all, you're not, you shouldn't think less of yourself because you were purchased with the blood of Jesus. You were infinitely loved. He had a plan for your life before one day came to be all that was written in his in his book, he knows you. He knows the hairs on your head. For some of us, that's easier than others, right? He's got, he knows everything, every detail about us. He knows it all, and he loves us infinitely, completely, eternally. So we should never think less of ourselves. We just think of ourselves less. Don't put yourself at the center. You're infinitely valued, but you are called to incredible service. So then Jesus goes further, verse 36. He says, he took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Jesus takes his child and says, this is, welcome the children. Now, when we read that, we might think, okay, it seems like Jesus is changing the subject here. Like, he's talking about humility, and now he's talking about kids. Like, what's, where's the disconnect? But Jesus really isn't changing the subject at all. In fact, these verses, I believe, have very little to do with children at all. The child is an object lesson. Now, there's other places where Jesus blesses the children. Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. But that's not what he's doing here. He's using the child as an object lesson. I know churches might take this, this theme verse and they plaster it on the wall of their kids' ministry, uh, but that's not really what Jesus is doing here. You see, the Aramaic word that is used is that same word is used for both children and servants. They use the same word for both. So Jesus is kind of using the child to be a symbol of a servant. He's not talking about children. He's talking about being childlike. And in what way? How are we being childlike? Well, because children are naturally those who adopt verse 35. Now, kids have pride too, right? Sometimes. But, but younger kids, they don't have a hard time with verse 35. Who wants to be first must be the very last and servant of all. Little kids understand they're little. Right? They... They understand that they're not the biggest people in the room, that they're not the ones in charge. And Jesus is saying, you need to be like them. Small children are small, and they're okay with being small, but as we get older, as we get bigger, we tend to make ourselves bigger than we actually are. We want to be the ones who are at the top. We want to be the ones who are in charge, commanding other people, ordering other people around. 
But Jesus instead takes this child and he says, no, you need to be like this child. In the kingdom of God, you are not only to be humble, but Jesus says, anyone who welcomes one of these little children. In other words, we're to honor those who serve in this way. We're to set as the ideal, not the person who has a lot of power. We're to set as the ideal, the person who humbly serves other people without asking for anything in return. Those who, who accept a lower position. He says, whoever welcomes one of these children, that word welcome means to bring in as a family member. I mean, it's not only, hi, how are you? But you are one of me. You are one of us. If we embrace that kind of childlikeness, if we embrace that kind of servanthood, now we are being, uh, as Christ is asking us to be here. He says, don't build the kingdom around those who would argue about who's greatest. He says, build the kingdom around those who genuinely are seeking the good of another person without considering how it's going to help them be rewarded later. That's what Jesus says we are to do. But man, can pride sneak in there, can it? We want to do this. We understand this is what Jesus is calling to, but it's so easy for us to lose our Christ-like, our child-like Mess. And I wanted to share just a little bit of my own story about this this morning, if I could. So I, some of you know I've been working at Dollar General like 10, 15 hours a week since July. You know, I, when I started, part of my motivation was, you know, I feel like, well, what are we, church? Salt the light. Salt the light, but I spent a lot of time lighting up my office. And I'm like, i got to see people that aren't a part of my church, especially people that may not come into my church uh, for whatever reason. So I felt like God wants me to do something for uh, to get out in public, to see people, to try to, to be salt and light out there somewhere. But the truth is that even after I figured out God was asking me, nudging me to apply at Dollar General, I'm ashamed to say it took several weeks before I actually did it. It wasn't like, okay, God, yes, this is where you want me. Fill out the application. It was weeks. It was kind of like the Gideon thing. Like, are you sure, God? Is this really what you want? Is this really what you want? You want me to do this? It took me a while. <coughs> this has been a discipleship thing for me. <laughs> I can share that as your pastor. And I think the reason it took me a while, I'll never forget when I first became a youth pastor, I went to a meeting, a uh, district conference in Shipshawana, and I got went in, in a meeting with other pastors. I'll never forget a uh, Billy Hesketh. He, he opened a little of me by saying, "Gentlemen, we are professionals," and he was making a point about returning phone calls and being, you know, treating people like you're a professional. But there was a, a period of time, not so much today, but there was a period of time where pastor was considered kind of the same strata as a lawyer or a doctor or somebody that had great authority and, and standing in society. And we don't expect to go to Dollar General and see our cardiologist stocking shelves. And it took me a while to get over that. Not because necessarily I was offended by the idea of stocking shelves that much. <laughs> but because what will people think about the pastor working at Dollar General? Are, are people going to think, oh, the church must not be doing really well if he's working here. They're, or, or they're not paying him enough. Or, man, these stuff must be really hard up. So there's a word for that. <laughs> Pride. Pride. As much as I try to pretend I'm humble at times, God calls me out. He calls us out on it, doesn't he? There's a story of Booker T. Washington. You might know who he was uh, in the 
after the Civil War, he's one of the most uh, famous African Americans at that time. He was a famous black scholar. He uh, led the uh, Tuskegee Institute, which was a, a school uh, for blacks that were trying to get educated after the Civil War. There's a story about him, though, that he was walking through a very wealthy section of town, and a white woman stopped him and asked if he'd like to earn a few dollars because she had some things that needed to be done. She needed some wood chopped and put into her house. She had no idea that he was Booker T. Washington. No idea. But amazingly, he, he went with her. He said, okay. And he went and he did what she needed done. He chopped the wood. He brought it into the house, set it next to the fireplace. This rich white woman's uh, daughter, after he was finishing, recognized him and went to her mom and said, this is Booker T. Washington who is chopping our firewood. She, the daughter, recognized who he was. And he was a man of standing, a man who had earned that standing by overcoming slavery, by making himself educated, by working hard and becoming respected in a society that didn't still respect African Americans very much. And so the next day, this rich white woman went to his office and found him and apologized profusely to him. And his response was so gracious. He said, no, I like working with my hands sometimes. It's important for me, I think, to do that. And he said, and I always like helping out a friend. This wealthy woman was so impressed, she told her friends and Booker T. Washington didn't do this for any reward that was coming to him. Later, but this woman told her friends, and her friends all donated thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute because they were so overwhelmed with his graciousness and the strength of his character and his humility. And nobody would have blamed him for being angry at this woman. After all, like I said, he, he was born into slavery. He overcame. He educated himself. He worked hard to escape poverty, and at that time, he was one of the most famous African Americans in the country. He was somebody, and he could have had a right to say, who do you think you are? But he didn't. See, Booker T. Washington was a Christian. He loved Jesus Christ, and he was transformed by that, and willing to be a servant. And so, kind of in my own story, as I'm wrestling over those few weeks with actually filling out the application, struggling with this idea, and I felt God like kind of say to me, like, so you say you want to reach people for <laughs> Christ. This is a community of hardworking people who work with their hands, factory workers, and you're not sure if you can work retail because of what people might think. I was like, I felt God say, so Tell me, Jeff, what else are you not willing to do for the kingdom of God? Ouch! We say we'll do anything for God, and then he calls us out on it. Shows us the pride that was just under the surface. Kind of like Peter at the Last Supper. You remember Peter? Uh, truth is, one of you is going to betray me. Oh, not me, Jesus. Not me. I'll go to my death for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, you are so insecure that before this night is over, you're going to deny that you know me just to save your own skin. Now, Peter, you're going to do great things. You're just not ready yet. There's some things we got to work out before you're ready for that. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, in other words, Jews who are practicing. To those not having law, in other words, Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. You hear what he says there? 
I have become all things to all people. Why? To win some. He recognizes he's not going to win all people, but to save some, I'm willing to do what I need to do. If you could wrap this up in one sentence, it would be, I will do what I will do anything I have to in order to reach people for Jesus. I'll meet them on their turf. I'll go where they are. I'll get to know them because saving sinners is all that's important to the apostle Paul. So Jesus says, you want to be great? Become a servant. For the sake of the kingdom, without regard to how it's going to help you, benefit you, affect you, that's a hard lesson <laughs> Jesus teaches, but it's one as Christians we must learn. When I started a dollar general, I thought my whole thing was, oh, I'm, it's for the people, the customers that come in, I'm going to hopefully be salt and light for them, and I pray that happens, but I mean, most of the time it's like, hi, how are you doing? Just, you know, check them out, there you go. My coworkers, that I'm getting to work with people that probably, as it stands today, may not walk into our sanctuary. They're good people, and some of them, at least, I'm not sure where they stand with the Lord. And I realized that it's been 21 years since I've worked with somebody that wasn't a born-again believer. And I pray that I'm being salt and light to them in some way. But what I've learned, what I am learning, I've not learned the lesson yet I'm in the process. What I am learning is that when we tell God where we won't go, we're telling him what territory we've ceded to the enemy. A servant doesn't get to decide what instructions to obey. Jesus said to go to all the world. And one more thing in this passage. Jesus says that when we welcome, uh, he says this, uh, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, that is Jesus, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. In other words, you're embracing me, Jesus says as a family member, when you embrace this kind of servant. But you're embracing the kingdom of God when you embrace this kind of servanthood. If we celebrate humble servants who are welcoming him and embracing the Father, we are embracing a connection with God by putting his kingdom first. I want to invite the worship team up because we're going to close in a couple of worship songs. But I guess as we close, my, my challenge is, you know, I'd be here this morning and you might be sensing that God wants to use you in some kind of ministry. It may not be working retail, Maybe it is. It may be talking to a neighbor you've not struck up a conversation with. But it may be stepping into a new role in the, in the church. But maybe God's calling you to something and you're resisting. And maybe God's revealing some area of pride that he won't let you surrender. My encouragement is somebody who's walking through and surrender to his will and say yes. In childlike faith. God, I thank you for um, thank you for the word, the way that Jesus turns the kingdom upside down. The disciples are fighting about which one of them is going to play lead. You're encouraging them, be the guy that sweeps the floor after the show. That's what the kingdom is. And so, Lord, I pray that you would. Help us to examine our hearts, Father. Because I, I think I know everybody in this room well enough to know that we all want to, to please you and honor you in every way. As David said, Lord, search me and know my heart. Test my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so, Lord, if there's pride in us that's hiding under the surface, or maybe not under the surface, maybe it's come up ways that we've seen. God, Lord, rid us of that. Help us to be genuinely humble people. Help us, Lord, to embrace what Paul said, that I will do whatever I have to do in order to reach people for Jesus. Because we don't want to cede any territory to the enemy. We want to serve you with all of our heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
you stand, please? We're going to sing. Sweetly broken, which is God's desire for us, right? That we be broken before him and we cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. Humbling feeling being sweetly broken. This song right here kind of really with the message, you know, God, Jesus will read the 99, go get that one. Let's sing this to him. Reckless love. Oh, I spoke the word. 
Amen. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless.